Tears of the Kingdom. That's the name of the next Zelda game. I'm a huge fan of the series and so seeing this trailer got me incredibly excited and I just needed to talk about it. This is, I think, a really special trailer because we can now start to finally make good assumptions about the game's story and theme, I think. So I made this analysis. It's the most complete one so far, I think, and the conclusions are backed by some really interesting evidence. But I want to say at the beginning that I'm actually normally not a YouTuber. I just wanted to talk about this so badly that I made this. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I'll do an analysis of every little detail that I was able to see in the 90 second trailer first, and then I'll talk about what the details mean for the plot of the game. The trailer opens with a mural depicting some kind of mysterious entity. The dim, flickering light, as well as the orange hue on the stone and small embers in the air, make it clear that the wall is being lit by some sort of fire source. However, it is not the wall that Zelda and Link inspected in the first trailer, as the surface of the rock there is much less even. The static camera is reminiscent of a cutscene narrated by Impa in the first game, detailing the events 10,000 years ago, that cutscene, however, had its art on tapestry. The entire cutscene features a vignette, an effect used in cutscenes in the first game whenever there was a depiction of something that happened a long time ago that was used either at the beginning or throughout a cutscene. As we will go over, there's a majestic and divine aura this entity gives off in the entire trailer. It has piercing eyes that reminded me of Majora at first, big antler-like extensions at the top of the head that can be interpreted in a number of ways, either being part of its body or some kind of big ornamental headgear. And as we will see later, it is quite tall, with elaborate ornamentation on its body as well. These small circles are featured on the waists of other figures and look quite like noble metal decorations, like chains, necklaces or jewelry. We see a bunch of symbols on the entity's chest, as well as big bracelets on its arms in a different shot, and we will definitely talk more about this being in a moment. The second shot of the trailer then shows a battle between monsters and possibly Hylians. They have pointy ears, but that is not only true for Hylians in this game. We see Moblins and Bokoblins, however, pressing forward on a bed of what is almost certainly malice. The art style is different though to the one in Impa's cutscene, so these depictions might very well be from a different time or a different culture. It's important to note that all these monsters have their front-facing horns we saw in the second trailer. This is interesting because if this depicts an old battle of legend, like might seem most intuitive at first, we need to ask ourselves why Breath of the Wild Moblins didn't have horns and these in the sequel suddenly do. That could either mean that some ancient monsters have somehow returned to Hyrule, or that there is indeed time travel like some have speculated. Um, now, there is a third option. That would be that this is not a past event, but maybe a prophecy of old about the events that will take place during Tears of the Kingdom. As of now, we don't know what's true, but I'll talk about time travel and why I think it's unlikely to be in this game later in this video. The Bokoblins are depicted with their usual Boko clubs. The Moblins, however, wield some sort of double scythe we haven't seen in game before. Lastly, at the top of the screen, we see two other creatures, but they are cut off, so the only thing that is visible looks a bit like some kind of leather wing. They seem too big to be keys, so they might be new flying enemies, fought like in the Nintendo patterns for aerial combat from a while ago. These likely Hylian soldiers fighting the monsters have different clothing, the combat units at the bottom wearing longer robes than the ones above them. We see some brave soldiers fighting at the very front, within the malice one of them between the two moblins has even fallen. There's also a second dead figure on the far right. These fallen warriors in the malice and the amount of screen covered by enemy troops signals that these monsters are overrunning the Hylians. Now, interestingly, the bottom row of soldiers don't seem to be carrying any weapons. In fact, two warriors are fighting barehanded within the malice at the bottom of the screen. They do, however, carry their shields in their left hand instead of the right, like the other units. Their front two soldiers' right arms are raised in battle. Now, it is also Link's right arm that gets mechanized in this game. So are these actually ancient fighters using similar weapons? 
We then get a more detailed shot from the entity at the beginning. And trust me, <laughs> there's a lot to go over here. As we see here, it stands on a hovering platform that bears some resemblance in its design to the ceiling above Ganondorf's body in the first trailer. While this trailer is full of Zonai imagery later on, and I completely expect them to be at the core of this game, this platform actually looks more like ancient Sheikah design to me. We'll actually need to talk about the Sheikah quite a bit too in this video, and even more than you might expect. To the left, we see a stone design framing the mural as well as runes that currently can't be translated, but most likely tell the story being depicted. We also get a look at the body of this mysterious creature and its heavily adorned robe. The collective opinion is that this deity is Hylia, and the imagery does clearly portray this character as divine and majestic. Surrounding it are seven symbols that many have pointed out to look like tears, which I believe is the correct and important connection, though a commenter under a Zeltic video rightfully pointed out that they also look like Magatama or Magatama, I'm not really sure, old Japanese icons of spirituality. Not only that, its stance with both arms extended equally to the left and right and the lowered palms makes it look calm, meditative and serene, like it's in control of the seven tiers, possibly protecting them or blessing the land with them from the heavens above, as we can see clouds around it as well as rays of probably sunshine. Below it are mountains that don't stick out of the stone like the rest of the imagery in the relief, but are instead carved into it, which makes it jump out less and is a simpler technique. The focus of this mural is clearly on the deity. Another majestic feature is what could be long flowing hair. Now these swirls are nothing uncommon in Zelda and stylized art in general, and so these could just be hair, like in a different figure in this trailer, but they also feature a line crossing them, so it's unclear if this is cloth or something else. Nonetheless, long flowing capes or headdresses or manes have shown power in many cultures and in nature, so this is no different. So even though it has its piercing eyes, it seems to give off a benevolent aura and actually the combination of eerie but ultimately good is quite an interesting one we have seen in Breath of the Wild already. This deity has been compared to Blue Peace and the Lord of the Mountain, mainly because of its face structure and its, well I'll call them antlers. This is an easy connection to make as both this figure and its power, the arm in the first trailer as well as some other things in this newest one, and the Lord of the Mountain and the Bloopy have a shared greenish glow. There is a quest in the first game where an NPC tells Link that he saw a mysterious creature in the wild and was left frozen in shock. He later finds out that it was the Lord of the Mountains and that this figure isn't evil but still jokes about how scary it looked. The Lord of the Mountain and the Bloopies seem to be quite mysterious entities. There is lore talking about how the Bloopies might be the reason why there's rupees in Hyrule at all and the Lord of the Mountain is supposed to be the spirit of a sage protecting the wild. Now, I must say, especially with how that spirit hand looked in the first trailer, I would really enjoy it if the goddess that is benevolent in this new game actually looks kind of creepy or eerie. That would actually be fitting considering media that inspired Breath of the Wild like Studio Ghibli and Princess Mononoke. There's a bunch of similarities here and in Princess Mononoke there is also pretty creepy life gods so let's address the elephant in the room. Seven tears most likely made everybody think of the seven sages immediately, a Zelda staple. But it could also mean the seven heroines, a Gerudo legend of Breath of the Wild that has statues in the desert, one of which has a tear-like symbol. Actually, the Gerudo legend also tells of these seven heroines sealing away Ganon and the runes translate to seven sages, so there is a connection here. Let's get back to the symbols for a moment. 
they look tear-like, with the one obvious change being that they are upside down. This is interesting. In Breath of the Wild, we saw droplets of water falling down at every Sheikah Tower, but in Tears of the Kingdom's second trailer, we saw a droplet of water falling upwards. Now that's most likely due to the time reversal ability, as we are shown the clip right after the ability's introduction. Right after it, however, we see Link rising upwards through the floor with another liquid-like animation. In this newest trailer, we see another instance of time reversal that, like in the second trailer, makes the surrounding world grey. Now, this is not the case in the droplet scene, but I think that's most likely due to it being a cutscene and the grey filter being a gameplay addition, since before the droplet rises, we see its original splash that it made as it fell down also getting reversed. Still, the theme of tears flowing upwards will be quite important and one of the main aspects of why this game is called Tears of the Kingdom. Let's move to the next shot. A figure with pointy ears levitating in much the same way as Ganondorf is seen arched backwards in the first trailer. However, this is not Ganondorf, as trailer 1 showed us that he has round ears, though the figure has a symbol on its forehead, like Ganondorf. This is also true for the seven heroines, though. The elegant clothing and shared symbols and design on the dress and chest with the deity, the long hair and its connection to the deity make it likely to be Zelda. We see bracelets similar to those of Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild's Zelda in her White Maiden outfit. To the right of the frame we see some being also wearing adornments around the waist as well as a stick with some kind of spiral pattern which I can't decipher. It's not the deity however that's holding Zelda up and below her we see a bit of malice. The next shot we see is of the same person matching every detail on the body and at the end of the trailer we get the confirmation that it's holding its hand up in a quite peculiar way to the deity which makes it even more likely to be Zelda as Zelda is the reincarnated goddess Hylia in human form so this connection between a goddess and a girl is most likely those two. Additionally, if this goddess is connected to the green power like we all assume, then that connects it to the Lord of the Mountain and interestingly, both the Lord of the Mountain and the Bloopy have owl-like faces. Now, in the book Creating a Champion for Breath of the Wild, there is a part that talks about animal imagery in Zonai structures and it mentions three different animals. The boar that represents power, the dragon that represents courage, that's also interesting, and owls that represent wisdom. So we can connect wisdom to these two figures and that of course also makes it likely to be Zelda. The image seems to be at the right of the wall as there's another framing design and some additional runes. And at the top of the screen we see two tears emitting light, yet one of them is facing the other way. They are both still upside down, however. We then switch to a gameplay section of Link opening a massive door featuring the same runes on an Ouroboros-like dragon undoubtedly in the Zonai style of Breath of the Wild. But while the game's logo features two dragons eating each other, this depicts a dragon with two heads. Now, I did speak about the dragon symbology in Zonai architecture a second ago and that linking it to courage and to Link possibly, but I'm hesitant to say that this is some kind of Link symbology, as the dragons could also just be symbols for the sky in general, as there's multiple dragons for multiple powers in Breath of the Wild and they all rise through the clouds to go into a different plane in Breath of the Wild. We can also see in the shot that Link already has his technological arm as he opens the door. The handle of the door is in the shape of a giant eye and eye symbology on the other hand will have huge relevance for this analysis. We see Link running towards a sky shrine with its signature upside down pyramidian design going from small at the bottom to larger at the top. This design is also present in all other sky architecture and 
below the floating islands, the stone also has a similar form. As Link is running, we see him having eight small flasks, with some of them filled with green energy on his waist. He's wearing his signature Breath of the Wild blue shirt and pants, with a cloak very similar to the Hylian hood, just with the head free. In the first shot, Link is not wearing his arrow pouch, nor a sword, while in the second shot, he does alongside a new bow and shield and some kind of sword. The outfit in the first shot is the same as in the first trailer and a bunch of scenes, only that he is missing the master sword. So is this at the start of the game? As Link runs forward in the second shot, we see snow on the island to his right, but there's also snow behind him. We get a bit of a look at the structure from trailer number two and the islands with their golden trees. We also see green stone below the islands as mentioned and a bit of green energy that is possibly holding them up. Additionally, we see one of the dragons or possibly a new dragon's tail behind the island to the left. As Link falls, we can see him transitioning into a different position, which seems to show the gameplay patterns from Nintendo for Aerial Combat again. The trailer then showcases the seamless loading between sky and earth. Link seems to be diving straight into a cloud, and I sincerely hope that means you can just jump off anywhere and do not need to find specific holes in the clouds like in Skyward Sword. But I'm pretty certain that the Zelda team knows the criticism that Skyward Sword got and will have adjusted that. Next is the black and white time reversal segment where Link rewinds time on a ruin fragment making it fly upwards instead of falling down like it once did, ingeniously allowing him to get from the earth to the sky that way. There's also a hole on the ground that is not present in Breath of the Wild in this exact location. Yet again in this scene he has no pouch and no sword so I'm just really not sure is this early game or is his equipment misleading us. While Link is lifted into the air, we see a bunch of rocks and islands floating close to him as well as a storm. As Link flies up, we see a new winged creature that maybe is an enemy shown in the first wall panel. I'm not sure. Link next scene shows him with his new arm, but longer hair and a more primitive outfit, as well as an axe made with a bone handle. He is climbing the root of a tree, which could just be for the trailer or indicate that the rock around it is not climbable. People have pointed out that there is a particle effect in this scene that is similar to the Lost Woods, so is the reason for the Deku Tree's disappearance that it has been lifted into the sky to save it possibly? In the next falling shot, we see a bunch of small islands, a medium-sized one in the middle and one large one in the back. We see Hyrule Castle lifted off the ground with Malice below it and Death Mountain is also spewing Malice. This is also clearly visible in the promotional art for the game. We get a big look at Hyrule Below's with multiple noteworthy things. First, there are no visible shrines or towers. All Sheikah technology seems to be missing. In fact, right here in this water is where the Richland Tower should be that is missing. We see a different tower to its left that's similar to the Zonai Tower art from Breath of the Wild's Creating a Champion book. And bizarrely, we can even see the art on the stone for the cliffside etchings quest from Breath of the Wild on the wall of a mountain but not the shrine. The question is then why all Shika technology has disappeared? Does this play before it rises like some could speculate or has the technology gone back into the earth after being used? Of note is also that in the Hyrule Nordlands we see a big glowing symbol. This is similar to the Nazca lines, massive symbols that were only visible from high up in the sky or mountains. And why these are in Hyrule is unclear. It might be a way of communicating with gods above, as we can see a second one depicting Hylia on Illumini Plateau. The first one is a bit further away, and so it's not exactly clear. I think it could also be Hylia. Maybe it's also some kind of different symbol. 
He lands then on what is another big reveal of the trailer, another Zonai colored, Zonai style, Aztec inspired stone bird that glides him across the world. Now on its tail it has some different runes and at least in the footage it does not change its course. So can you maneuver it or does it have a fixed path? Link then flies to the second rune and we see some stables as well as wood structures from Breath of the Wild's world indicating that again this might mean that not much time has passed and this is present day Hyrule. We also get a quick glimpse at green swirls like in the first trailer above Ganon and connecting it with the second trailer this might be a spot where Link can travel upwards to the sky. We then get a logo and title reveal and a look at the Master Sword. Now the Master Sword is absent from the Japanese logo. It has interestingly a green tip, a green blade reminiscent of Twilight art from Twilight Princess and looking back at the symbols on the Plains of Hyrule, these also look similar to green lines all over Twilight imagery in Twilight Princess. Behind it is the real deal though. We get a confirmation here that it's Zelda crossing hands with the deity from the beginning of the trailer. The cloth of Zelda and the little markings on the rope match up as well as the ear. And above both we see the two tiers again and the game being called Tears of the Kingdom. So what does this mean? Well I think we have enough information to finally start piercing everything together. The first trailer showed us the antagonist most likely being Ganondorf and trailer 2 then revealed some powers as well as the sky while in this trailer we got the title which Nintendo said is important for the plot of the game as well as more information about apparently the objects we are chasing, the theme and this goddess. I think we can start looking at the plot by now. At the beginning of the game, Zelda and Link travel into a cave system where they find Ganondorf. Link here is still wearing his Breath of the Wild outfit as well as carrying his Master Sword and this is pretty likely the beginning of the game as he does not have his arm yet which will probably be a central gameplay mechanic. Ganondorf then breaks free as the hand saves Link and Zelda and somehow Link's arm is corrupted. Now I guess that from there we will somehow reach the sky and through some sort of event the sky islands need to appear in Hyrule. I don't think we're traveling back in time. I did consider this maybe being the moment where Hylia came down to the earth and maybe became Zelda for the first time even before Skyward Sword but in that case Link could not have the Master Sword as that one is only crafted in Skyward Sword. I did then think about it maybe being the Master Sword from the future but this is really convoluted and looking at interviews I think the Zelda team just enjoys to vaguely use themes and times but not make them match 100%. We all talked about the Koroks and different things in Breath of the Wild and in the end it just was kind of a mix. So I actually don't think it's likely we will have much Twilight connections and Twilight Princess stuff in this game even though it looks similar um, and I also don't think we're gonna travel to through time that is pretty common in Zelda games and it's always really nice because it makes the world double in size so I understand why we want that to happen but I think the different stables and stuff give us a clue that the Hyrule on the ground is actually present-day Hyrule. Now that leaves the question why Link has long hair in some shots and interestingly we've only ever seen long hair Link on Sky Island or in the sky. Maybe there are portions playing in the past only in the sky. I'm not sure though. So why is the game called Tears of the Kingdom? Well what I didn't mention is that with both the deity and Zelda we see three triangles under their eyes and three triangles not only is imagery that could be linked to the Triforce but we know of eyes with three triangles, the Sheikah. And the Sheikah have a tear below the eye symbol normally so to make the connection and say this game will be about the Sheikah is not that far-fetched and a conclusion we can get to pretty easily. 
However, we then need to ask ourselves why the three triangles, maybe depicting eyelashes stylistically, why they are below the eye or not above, like in all Shika imagery we know. Well, there is actually a tribe of Shika that has the triangles below it, and it's one that appeared in Breath of the Wild. It's the Yiga. Now, I talked about Breath of the Wild's Creating a Champion book a second ago. It's a book that was released after Breath of the Wild and its DLC, talking about the creation process as well as a bit about the future ahead and the next Zelda game. And so the team could speak about all kinds of things that happened throughout the development process and even after the game was finished and they turned to the next installment. Now, the book also goes into detail about the origins of the Shika. It says, In the Age of Myth, the Shika were sent by the goddess Hylia to protect her reincarnated mortal form. The reincarnated goddess was said to have been an ancestor of the royal family of Hyrule, which is why the Shika have guarded the royal family from danger through the ages and been tasked with passing down legends and knowledge. There are a few pages devoted to one plot point in particular, which is the creation of the Yiga. On page 368, there's the chapter The Shika Divided that tells of the King of Hyrule 10,000 years ago seeing the technological prowess of the Shika and their vast power surpassing those of his people that made him fear the Shika. It says, He became possessed by thoughts of imagined Shika betrayal. He issued an order to abolish technology and began to op oppress the Shika. The Sheikah's laboratories were closed, research was prohibited, and data was destroyed. Their best researchers were expelled from the kingdom and monitored. Any Sheikah who dared oppose this was met with severe punishment, including imprisonment. This oppression led to dramatic changes within the Sheikah tribe and ultimately to a division into two main factions. The moderate group chose to live peacefully, accepting the restrictions placed on them out of respect for their long-standing ties to the royal family. They built a hidden village, now known as Kakariko Village, and lived there in Suikud. Those who violently rejected the king's decree formed a militant group that specialized in assassination, the Sheikah's original dark purpose. In time, they came to follow Calamity Ganon. They retreated to a remote Gerudo province outside of the kingdom's Hyrule Reach and later formed the Yiga clan. So what we have here is an originally possibly different race whose purpose sent by Hylia was to protect the kingdom and the Hylians until a conflict ensued. And in this conflict, some Sheikah decided to follow the king's orders and become much more primitive. This is the reason why in Breath of the Wild we see that there's this vast and powerful Sheikah technology, but the Sheikah of the present day are living as pretty normal villagers and the Sheikah that then decided to rebel against the king. I think that this split between the Sheikah and the Hylians and their kingdom was a tragedy that then went on to make the Sheikah add a tear to their symbol. We can see in the Akcha in the sky that the eye on the door that Link opens does not have a tear. So is this architecture predating the split? There's a difference between the tear pointed upwards and downwards. Now, my theory is that the Yiga picked this tear deliberately as it flows upwards into the heavens to their original creator and to the race that was originally free and powerful and was then controlled. The Zonai architecture in the sky is really interesting because it makes us ask if the original race, what the Shika were before we knew them as the Shika, might have been the Zonai and that they then disappeared because the kingdom hunted them. They might have returned to the sky, leaving the people alone, and some of the Shika that stayed on the ground then split into the ones that became obedient and the Yiga that might still remember or more likely still carry symbols from their distant past and their home in the sky. I hope that in this game we see the return of Hylia as well as learn more about the Zonai, the creation of the Sheikah and this great tragedy that led them to split. This way the tear, both facing downwards as well as upwards, is at the center of this story. It's the reason why the game is called this way and the reason why the tears are in the other direction in the mural. 
I want to point out one last thing that gives this more credibility, which is an interview at the very end of the Creating a Champion book with the director of Breath of the Wild, Hidemaru Fujibayashi. Now, he speaks about the process of creating Breath of the Wild, and he says the following. Every day, we would think of new, fun ideas, and it was a series of joyful moments as we got to realize those ideas in the game. The more ideas we had, the more massive the scale of the game. But as robust as this game is, there were still a number of ideas we couldn't implement or which left only traces. In some cases, that left things a mystery. For example, why is the Yiga clan's crest an upside-down version of the Shika eye symbol? Naming this as the first example of an idea that didn't make it into the story and the background of Breath of the Wild is really interesting. I think this is a solid clue that the answer to that very question will be in Tears of the Kingdom. Now, having said that, there are still two questions at the core of this, which are firstly, why there is a long-haired Link, and secondly, what happened to the Master Sword, as well as why the Sheikah technology is missing. Some last few things that I want to say wrapping this all up is that the antlers from Hylia could also possibly be really, really long ears. Like, the Hylians often get described with their long pointy ears, so their goddess possibly having really, really long ears could make sense. And what I find interesting is also in the trailer footage that we've seen by now is that we've never actually seen a full transition from the earth to the sky or the sky to the earth. I don't know if there's anything important to that, but yeah, that's been everything I was able to find in this trailer. That's my theory. I think this is likely to happen. And if you have a different opinion or if you notice different things, you can write that in the comments and I will try to reply. There are, of course, things left in Breath of the Wild, like the mysterious 8th heroine in Gerudo Desert. So there's still mysteries left to uncover. That's what's going to make it fun. And I don't know about you, but I am incredibly excited. And yeah, thank you for watching. As I said, I don't do YouTube videos normally. So that was everything I wanted to say about this. Maybe I'll do another video at some point. But yeah, that's been it. I'm looking forward to finally playing this game in a few months.